Um, that film was awesome. Thank you so much. And the, you know, in the Story of Stuff project, we call these people our heroes. They are literally our heroes. Like in the world of plastic waste, it is like you guys have front row tickets to the Rolling Stones of plastic waste right here. Like this is as good as it gets. So savor that. Um, one thing about plastics that some of you already know and some of you are just, just newly coming into this world is that if you start looking at plastics, it's so rewarding and it's so intriguing that it easily can become a lifelong passion. So I am going to really inadequately introduce each one of these people because um, it would take the entire session that we have if I was actually going to tell you everything they did. We have, just so you know, we have an hour and a half here together. I'm going to run through a bunch of questions with them and we're going to save the last 30 minutes for questions. So we have um, Dia Schlossberg, the filmmaker and director producer of the Story of Stuff. We have Stiv Wilson, my friend and creator and producer of the Story of Stuff, currently the campaigns director at the Story of Stuff Project. Emma Priestland, corporate campaign coordinator at Break Free from Plastic, based in Europe. Yvette Aralo is a policy and research, uh, policy research and grassroots advocate with Texas Environmental Justice Advocacy Services, a wonderful organization that works in Texas on environmental and racial justice issues. <coughs> Froylian Great, who we all just call Froy, who's the executive director of Gaia the Philippines. Um, we said the word Gaia a bunch when you guys were up there. I don't know if you guys know. Gaia is the Global Anti-Incinerator Alliance. It's a global network. Last I heard, 91 countries. Is that right, Christy? There's an international coordinator. Almost 100 countries of people fighting incinerators and promoting alternatives. And Tiza Mafira is the ED of Indonesia Plastic Bag Diet Movement, a community-based organization that advocates for awareness and policies. But... Like many things, it takes a village to make a film and it takes a village to fight big plastic. And so there's a lot of other people I just want to quickly call out. Could you please raise your hand if you are a Story of Stuff project staff, staff, Ooh, <laughs> board member, board member, supporter or donor to the Story of Stuff or Story of Plastic? I hope there's a lot of you in there. Thank you. Could you please raise your hand if you were one of the heroes interviewed in the film? Mar there's Martin from the Ecology Center. That's all of you guys. Raise your hands. That's all of you. <laughs> Could you please raise your hand if you are active in the incredibly powerful global movement, Break Free from Plastics? <laughs> awesome. And that, there's one of the founders of that right there, Nikki Davies. Thank you so much. Um, it really does take a village to do what we have to do, and you all are that village. So finally, raise your hand if you want to be part of the global movement to stand hey. up the big old plastic. Woo. All right, that's almost everybody. There's a couple of you I'm talking to afterwards. <laughs> um, so you can start being part of that movement right now by tweeting, Instaing, whatever it is you do, hashtag story of plastic. Go home, tweet, or you can even do it right now. Go home, tweet, post, share that, because we are still in negotiations with a distributor for this film, and the more buzz we get for this film, the better distribution it will get. Great. And if you're like me, a top thing on your mind is, how can everybody that you know see this film? So, hashtag story of plastic. Got it? All right. Um, I have... Um, <coughs> Uh, some questions first for everybody, and if we have time, I have a specific question for each of them based on their experience. I want to talk about four of the topics that I hear most about plastics when I'm out in the world talking about plastics, and I want to hear your thoughts on them, and some of them were touched on in the film. So the first is about recycling, because we all know people say, it's okay, it's recyclable. I like to say that recycling is the opiate of the masses. <laughs> They're just so happy. It's recyclable. They can just keep on consuming it. When I worked at um, Greenpeace in the early 90s, somebody sent me in a plain brown unmarked envelope a memo from the Industry Trade Association, from the Society for the Plastics Industries. And it was a memo from them to all the companies that make and use plastic, asking them to pitch into a PR campaign because anti-plastic sentiment was growing. And it literally said in this memo, if we can convince the American public that plastics is recyclable, we will see a net increase in plastics. Um, and you know what? They won. 
They convinced the American public that plastic is recyclable, and more plastics have been produced since that memo than in all time be before then. So recycling has a role in the solution and is an enormous problem because it has such a hegemony on our thinking about how we deal with plastic. So I want to open it up to folks in the panel. Um, what, what about recycling? It is a love-hate relationship. When somebody says, it's okay, it's recyclable, or when that, the companies say, we're going to recycle it better, what comes to mind? Emma, you look like you're ready to start. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, I mean, we saw a lot of the problems with recycling in that film, so we don't need to necessarily go into more details. But one thing we need to remember is that almost all plastics are technically recyclable. If you throw enough energy at it, if you do enough weird chemical processes, anything can be recycled. That doesn't mean that it should be. It doesn't mean that it's worth recycling. And my job is to work uh, trying to get the big corporations, the fast-moving consumer goods companies, to make changes to their packaging. And I think as a result of this huge global uh, pressure they're seeing, they've co they're coming forward with commitments. And we have companies like Nestle and Unilever, you know, the same ones who are the main polluters that we saw in the film, coming forward with commitments to make 100% of their packaging recyclable by, I don't know, 2025. But, you know, this is just... I can't say the word I want to say. This is stupid. It is already kind of sort of technically recyclable. They're not saying whether they're going to recycle it in the country that it was made. They're not saying whether it's feasible to recycle it, whether it's economically worth recycling it. It's just another way of continuing that PR campaign that started so many decades ago. So we need to demand more than uh, recycling, more than a recyclable package. We need to see no package. Yeah. <laughs> Others? Tisa? Oh, okay. Uh, thanks, Annie. Um, I think what we miss out on the narrative on recycling is that recycling is not separate from the entire supply chain necessary to get a piece of garbage to the recycling plant. Um, and then top, on top of that, not everything can be recycled. Um, you know, uh, you know, effectively. So uh, a lot of things are downcycled, which we don't want. Um, Indonesia is a place with 17,000 islands. We're an archipelagic nation. And maybe recycling centers are only available in about 10 cities. You know, and, um, you know, uh, we... We come face to face with industries in, in, in our own respective countries. We, we, we see firsthand what their narratives are. We see firsthand how they come to our events and say, you know, um, uh, reduction is not the solution. Banning is not the solution. They say um, everything can be recycled. Uh, there has to be better waste management. Um, you know, don't make an enemy out of plastic. Plastic is just a product. It's the people that are the problem. It's the people that have to be educated. All these narratives, every single day we hear. Um, and yet, what are their solutions? Create you know, better recycling plants. But where? Are they going to build them in 17,000 islands? I don't think so. So you know, it's not the solution. Steve, I want to ask you to chime in, because you work on plastics here in the US. So folks here in this room might be wondering, should I, or in this garden, folks here in this garden might be wondering, so should I keep rinsing out my plastic and put it in the bin? Should we recycle? So I think one of the biggest challenges with recycling as, you know, it, the, it, you, you saw a lot of themes in the film that are touching on this, is, you know, economics are based on supply and demand. And if recycling was really going to work, the companies that make plastic, extracting it from the ground, would not be promoting recycling because that would be competition. So that's a cynical ploy right there. They're literally saying like, yeah, just recycle. Um, but there's too much. That's, that's the bottom line of what we saw, um, both in the research um, and traveling the world to make this film, is Nobody could do anything with this amount of stuff. It's, it's just too much. And so the supply is always going to outweigh the demand. And to clean it, to um, rinse it, um, that takes a lot of, of, of effort. Um, so, yeah, we need source segregation first. And what I mean by that is, like, in Freud's system, Mother Earth Foundation system in the Philippines, um, Waste is separated before it ever contaminates itself. So, like, paper never touches metal, never touches plastic, never touches food waste. 
And that's why they're able to achieve these transformative results, is because the stuff that is recyclable still has value. But if you look at our recycling bin, even here in Mill Valley, where you know this is a, a very woke population, um, you see a tremendous amount of, of, of disregard. And you know, I feel sorry for Martin Burke here, who uh, <laughs> is he, he's the he's the lead garbage man in Berkeley, and the amount of stuff his staff has to deal with um, with contamination, uh, it's it's just not tenable. By by throwing all the stuff in one garbage can, it it becomes garbage. It's it's no longer uh, it, these materials no longer have value because to clean them and process them cost more money than they're worth on the end. Um, and there's only one plastic out there really that has a whole lot of value, and that's the number one, polyethylene terephthalate. Um, there's a little value in number twos, and depending on the weather, fives. The rest of it, no. And as Shibu says in the film as well, recycling is predicated on poverty. And that's what we wanted to uncover as uh, we went into these places, is what the actual conditions were like for, for people um, doing this work. Uh, the blue brand is not, you know, it does not get carried somewhere by rainbows on the wings of unicorns. It's, it's, it's a business and it's a broken business. That's a long-winded answer, sorry. From the petrochemicals point, I'd say that recycling when a couple of years ago when Break Free and the P4 group had a conversation with us about plastics, we automatically said we don't work on recycling. We'd, I'm part of an organization that's been doing this work for over 16 years and we've been focused on the toxic, toxic exposure at the front line and fence line of communities. So whether it's recyclable or not doesn't matter to us. It is still being produced, just like Stiv mentioned and Carol Moffat mentioned from Ciel. The problem is that we are in this relentless cycle of consuming where we do not need to consume these products. And it's a difficult conversation for us to have in this country but we cannot have other countries, other communities of color, of low wealth, be at the disposal of everyone who continues to consume at the same rate. So no, recycling doesn't work and neither does consuming. Awesome. She mentioned Carol Muffet from the Center for International Environmental Law. They have an awesome series online of um, fact sheets called Fueling Plastics about the connection between fossil fuel companies and plastics. I really encourage you get them, download them, put them in your neighbor's mailbox, post them at work, um, spread them far and wide. Um, okay, so that's um, pushback number one when we talk about plastics is people say, but it's recyclable. Pushback number two that I want you guys to comment on. But if they don't make packaging out of plastic, what are we going to make it out of? What do you want the corporations to do, recognizing that there are different kinds of corporations? There are the petrochemical companies that, that produce the plastic, the Exxon Mobiles, the Dows. There are the companies that um, use the plastic as packaging, the Nestle's, the Unilever's. And then there are the companies that sell the crap, the um, Targets, the Amazons, pretty much everything, almost everything <laughs> sells the stuff. So what, what do you want those companies to do? Well, news flash for them. We actually already have the solutions way before they came Whoa. in. Right? Uh, when I grew up, again, as, as mentioned in the film, we'd buy soy sauce or oil, bring our own glass containers. And we have this 15, 20 years ago. It's this advertising that we um, actually is telling us that we have it, that, that we need it, that has changed this. And looking at the market right now in the Philippines, it's not as if um, it's because it, we... we our lives depended on it. The reality right now is that that is the only option given to us. And they can't blame us for something, if, especially if they part of removing what worked before and only is giving us an option of what is really problematic at this point. Such a good point that the same companies that are saying there are no alternatives squish the alternatives. Anybody else on this? So uh, we work... Um, in Indonesia, we work first and foremost with the retailers, so the, the end of the supply chain that you mentioned. And then we work our way upwards. Um, and the reason why is because we wanted to um, 
we w because the retailers are the ones who are in touch with the end consumers. So we wanted to push the retailers to make a change that would also educate the consumers. It's a, it's a change from, from just working with educating consumers because it puts the onus not on the consumers but on you know, the private sector. Um, and what we did was that we pushed for you know, uh, uh, plastic bags to be charged, which they now are in Indonesia. Um, and we pushed for plastic bag bans, and which we've, we've managed to get five cities to ban plastic bags in Indonesia, and another 18 are following, um, are preparing for bans. Um, the, the pushback has been, oh, but what's the alternative, right? What's the alternative? Nobody can imagine a life without having plastic bags pushed into your hands at the, at the checkout. So what, what has happened, actually, is that, well, we have the solution since decades ago, since centuries ago, in fact, where now it's making a renaissance, it's making a comeback, which is that we're using baskets, we're, we're using, um, you know, uh, cotton bags. But these, these baskets are special because they're, they're unique to Indonesia. Um, Indonesian uh, culture has always, has always utilized woven things. Um, it's part of our it's part of what our ancestors did, not just for not just for shopping, but way before shopping became something of a thing. Uh, they used it to carry their babies. They used it to, you know, uh, hold stuff in their houses. They used it to collect potatoes, um, uh, rice from the farm. And so, uh, this is just coming back to remembering what we used to, how we used to live before um, plastics came into play. It wasn't such a bad life. Um, <laughs> And we can still do it again, you know. And the problem with these communities is that it doesn't add to the bottom line of the companies. It empowers communities. It empowers um, local livelihoods. It doesn't add to the income of the companies. That's why they're not supporting it. That is a problem. Whenever we're talking about plastics, for some reason, it's always the same products that we're, are thrown at us. And we fail to recognize the new products that have been thrown at us. The products that Amazon Prime, two-day shipping, grab-and-go foods, uh, Uber Eats have consistently fed consumer markets. This is a process. Consumer markets were able to go into a store and pick up their own foods, their own groceries. We supported local shops. We shopped smarter. And all of a sudden, we have this obsession with convenience that has a cost on all of us. Us, every single one of us, whether we are in an environmental justice community on the front line, to someone whose entire livelihood is fishing and the banks that their ancestors have fished for decades, we need to understand that that narrative that they're poising, that false narrative, is something we need to change. What is it that they're not telling us? Why is it that I can purchase this Sharpie? And why is that box filled with bubble wrap and excess packaging? We need to focus on these things. Emma, were you going to say something? Yeah, I mean, the, the, what plastic packaging is enabling is an extreme choice that we don't need. I live in a cold country, and yet, because of plastic, I'm able to get, I don't know, asparagus from Peru in December. I mean, that's not natural. Do I actually want to be eating something that has been wrapped in plastic, has been shipped across the whole world, just because it kind of tastes nice? It's, that's what we need to fight against. And the solutions for a lot of food packaging is the same solutions that we need to fight against, uh, you know, petrochemicals in agriculture, climate change, the shipping and transportation industry. It's about eating locally, eating in season. And we need to make sure that this kind of way of eating is accessible for everybody, not just the people with the higher incomes. So this is something that's really critical for people in the US and in Europe to really fight for that. And then when you're looking at the other kinds of packaging, you know, it's enabling a shelf life that is incredibly unnatural. Do you actually want to be putting that in your body if it's sat on a shelf in a shop for a year just because it's wrapped in plastic? Thank you. Um, I often hear that, but it's hard to give up strawberries in January, or it's hard to carry your own bag to the store. And someone said to me the other day, pick your hard. You can either carry your own bag to the store or deal with total global ecosystem breakdown and contamination. <laughs> like, pick your hard. We are going to change because this is not sustainable for us to continue this. We're either going to change by design or by disaster. 
And each way is going to take some adjustments. Each way is going to take some loss. Each way is going to have some hard. But if we change by design, which there are so many solutions to do, do, do it with, we can be so much more intentional and just about it. If we dig our heels in and refuse to change, we are still changing. Like continuing business as usual is no longer an option. We are still going to change, but it's going to be a lot more violent and a lot more unjust. So let's pick changing by design. Picking the hard of carrying your own bag from your bicycle to the grocery store. We can do that. I believe that we can do that. Um, all right, my third big, big pushback I often hear when I'm out talking about plastics is, but we can clean up the ocean. Um, this is in the wishful thinking department. I, I'm going to ask <laughs> Stiv if he wants to chime in on that because Stiv is a sailor who has sailed to all of the so-called gyres. Stiv, can we just clean up the ocean? Yeah, it's easy. There's a Dutch kid who's doing it. Um, <laughs> He's joking. If you're one of the, my friends on Facebook who yesterday posted that article about it's finally working, uh, please listen to yeah. Steve. Uh, there was a really interesting, uh, much, uh, there's been a lot of uh, efforts uh, throughout the ages to say we're going to clean up the ocean. And, you know, we can't even clean our beaches. So I'm not sure how it's going to be cost effective to burn diesel and use plastic piping in a web in the middle of the ocean uh, to collect it. Uh, and, you know, it broke the first time. And the second time, the, if you look on Twitter right now, there's um, a bunch of photos. And a bunch of biologists are uh, very upset at the fact that this is working. And you can look at little red circles of all the bycatch and all the life that is caught in the plastic. Uh, much of us who, many of us who've been critics of, of cleaning up the middle of the ocean um, have cited that we need an environmental impact assessment. What is the effect going to be on wildlife? Um, you know, I sailed many, many miles with um, uh, Carolyn Box, who's here as well from uh, Five Gyres, um, and uh, Doshi and uh, Annika. Um, not so much Katie because she gets seasick, but we have seen all of this, uh, you know, in the middle of the ocean, and we use this net to collect and sample. And even in a 25 by 60 centimeter opening, you get 50, 60, 70 percent bycatch. Now, in the name of science, I'm okay with the quantification um, with small organisms, but at the scale they're talking, it's insane. The other problem that I see with it is it doesn't put the responsibility on the company that made it. It like I was getting Facebook posts when this stuff had come through and say, somebody's saving the world. Like that's exactly how it is portrayed is that this kid is saving the world. And I'm like, no, he's taking thirty million dollars of resources that should be going to people like Tiza, Avet, and Freud to be doing their work. Because Froy can stop all plastic from going in the ocean in the Philippines for about $20 million. That's it. That's all it would take to stop all leakage of plastic into the ocean and implement the zero waste system there. So there's a disproportionate um, amount of resources going to these tech fixes, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Institutional racism, global north exceptionalism, uh, and just not listening to the experts on the ground in all of these places, which um, our film was predicated on, is actually listening to the people who know what the hell they're doing to solve these problems and not the people who just have the marketing machines. That's right. It's intervening at the wrong place in the system, and it's causing ecological disaster. The other thing is that the ocean is really, really, really big. Stiv told me that trying to clean it up like that is like standing in LA with a vacuum cleaner going, I'm getting rid of the smog. <laughs> and, and the plastic is so tiny, it's so micro, that they like to say that getting the plastic out of the ocean would be like getting the miso out of miso soup. <laughs> like you, you can only say that on the coasts. Um, <laughs> but it's just not going to work. Um, Emma, yes. I'm going to do a quick plug for the Break Free from Plastic movement. Please do. So groups have been doing cleanups on the beaches and the rivers and cities for decades because it feels good to do something, even if you know you're not actually solving the problem, to get out there, to collect things, it feels good. 
So what the Break Free From Plastic movement is doing is weaponizing that. We're turning cleanups on their head and we're counting what the actual brands are that are turning up on those beaches. So we saw it in the film. That was from last year's brand audits. We've just finished this year's brand audit. It took place on the 22nd, 21st of September, which is International Cleanup Day. We had approximately 400 different brand audits happening in around about 50 countries across the world. The amount of data we've collected is enormous, and we will be launching the report that analyzes that data on the 22nd of October, fingers crossed, if I get to write it in time. Uh, and I please ask you all, follow Break Free From Plastic, follow the social media accounts of all the groups here, share that, target those companies that are polluting our environments. That's so important because otherwise if we spend our weekends just cleaning up the beaches, it's kind of like this, we got this codependency thing going on, that they create this unsustainable product, throw it out into the environment, and we spend our weekends cleaning it up. We've got to bring the loop back to them and hold it accountable. So if you Google brand audit, you can find some guidance on how to do that. Thank you, Emma, for raising that. I'd okay. like to add that I know that we have such a strong conversation about water in the ocean, but we really need to take a step and pause on how much potable water, fresh water, drinkable water, these processes from fracking to processing to recycling are actually taking. Because we see other parts of the globe where water wars are happening actively and we need to stop and listen. How much water do we have left and is it worth all of this? That's right. Sorry. Yeah, just very quickly, uh, my, my response to this always is that uh, cleanups are predicated on helping marine uh, animals. So my wish is that as um, we try to save the turtles and all these animals, we don't poison our communities that are already suffering on this. Mm -hmm. Fair request, Troy. Thank you. Um, all right, now I've got a question for each of you that's more specific about your own work. And I want to start with Dea. Um, there's a lot of information out there about plastic. There are reports and articles and compelling photos and scientific studies. Why a film and why now? Um, great question. <laughs> um, so I think filmmaking has a, has a unique power to take people through an experience and help people feel the emotion um, of that experience so that they can own it and own the information they received because they've gone through a process. Um, and when you when you feel when you feel <laughs> sorry um, when you when you love the people in your films when you care about the people in your films you care about what they care about um, so combining your own um, sorry I'm totally nervous. Um, <laughs> we love you. Yeah, we love you. <laughs> um, oh, you can come back to me. Um, yeah, my, my, I'm sorry. <laughs> my brain is totally you fried. You can see how hard this process was of making this film by how brilliant all of these people are. And just imagine having hours and hours of of brilliant nuggets of wisdom and experience like this that we had to sort through to, to make that up. So I, I really want to focus on, I think it's amazing that we have them here and we have this gift and you, you get a little bit of, 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 a, of an idea of um, the, the challenge that the film was by this gift that we have of being able to hear more of their thoughts here today. You did a phenomenal job editing and, and cutting. Many people here did a phenomenal job. Yeah, I want to give a shout out to Tony Hale and Brian Wilson. Who Tony! <laughs> Brian! Um, I, I saw some of the rough cuts along the way, and I have to say the final product is just brilliant. And the, the insights and the reflections and the wisdom that you captured, you have created such a gift for the movement that we can now tell this story that it used to take us a, a full day, which is why people didn't invite us to parties anymore. <laughs> now, now we have an easily packaged way that we can tell the story. A number of us are still gonna wait for the eight day version of the film so that you can use the rest of that footage. But for those whose appetite isn't quite there yet, 
thank you so much for creating this film. We definitely need to release the car karaoke scenes from oh. from Jakarta <laughs> and Surabaya. They'll be in the extra features. Yeah, extra features. but I did want to say I years ago was an environmental educator and used film as a tool in classrooms, and I used the story of stuff um, frequently, and it really got kids to step back and 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 think about things in a different way, and. I feel like this is just an amazingly magical full circle thing that has happened. Um, <laughs> that that we're all here today, and um, we can hopefully keep using these these films as tools for for global change. We can. And a shout out to Ruben. Is Ruben here? Where did he go? Ruben drew the animations for the original story of stuff, and as you saw, his animations in this film that added so much. You know, he, sh he can show in 30 seconds what it would take you an hour to explain. So I don't know if Ruben's here, but we love you, Ruben, wherever you are. Freud, did you want to say something? Uh, just a quick story about how powerful this film is for us. Uh, two things. About 18 years ago, when we first campaigned against McDonald's stopping the use of uh, styrofoam cups for coffee, um, we did an action and we gave a letter petition for them. And they refused to meet with us. They sent their security guards to stop us and they refused to meet with us. And they said, we cannot stop using styrofoam cups in the Philippines because that decision has to come from our headquarters in the US, right? And only to know that in the US, they've stopped using it. So it's, a case, it's a clear case of double standard. But now, it's the same companies coming to us and say, how can we work with you, right? It's part, part of it's because of the brand audit change in the narrative. Uh, so that, that's the first one. Uh, that's how we envision the film to be uh, powerful. Uh, the second is, again, for the longest time, our voices from Asia has been um, missing in all of this. And we are being blamed for the problem, but the solutions that are happening have never been recognized. And I think for people in Asia to see this film and for, for it to be featured, I think it's a clear affirmation that we are part of this and the thing that we're doing there has an impact. So this is very powerful and we thank everyone for it. Thank you. Thank you. My next question is for Yvette and it's a perfect lead, thank you, Freud, for setting this up. Um, that's the power of organizing. Engage citizens working together have more power than individuals trying to navigate a supermarket and make change there. It is through coming together and taking collective action that we build our power. And the story of plastics talked about the massive petrochemical build out that the industry is trying to do right now to get all their drills in the ground as fast as they can and then to turn that stuff into plastics. Um, and, the, and the best way to respond to that is protest. That's how we build our power. And so the industry is cracking down and trying to criminalize, silence, um, dissent, and protest. And Texas is the front line of this um, crackdown on activism. Yvette, could you talk a little bit about the critical infrastructure bill, the so-called critical infrastructure bill that um, tries to squelch protest against fossil fuels and plastics facilities? Right, so the bill emphasizes and really focuses on activists as almost terroristic threats and places them and their lives, their family and friends, and the local community at risk because what it does is it creates a felony of the freedom of speech and the right to act and the right to basically protect our individual survivals. So when right after uh, Hurricane Imelda, when, well actually, when Greenpeace arrived to Houston, <laughs> and had 11 activists lunge off of the Hartman Bridge right off of Baytown, right next to ExxonMobil in the second largest refinery in the world. We saw that as a powerful act that we individually couldn't take because we don't have the resources to combat 
having actions like this. We rely, if anything, <laughs> rely on large green organizations like Greenpeace, who has resources to be able to come face to face with felony charges and actually live that entire process out. Why is it that in our fight for survival, we also have to combat institutional racism that has plagued our communities? Why is it that we cannot take a stand? Why is it that indigenous communities continue to fight for sovereignty, for identification? Uh, why is it that communities in Flint, Michigan, when they rise in order to fight for clean water, it is to silence them, stomp, and squash us? And we're, we can only be so lucky to have allies on the other side to stand up and say, you know what, we're here with you too. But it, it takes more than that. And we have to address the issues of institutional racism within our country and the effects that that takes on other countries and regions that we continue to colonize, spread imperialism and Western tactics of not only consumption, but the disposal of our communities, our culture and our livelihood. Because the communities along the Amazon do not deserve the endless fires for agriculture because Brazilian waters in indigenous lands are important to the Poncas in Oklahoma, the Homa Nation in southern Louisiana, the Gwechin in Alaska, the Permian Basin communities of low wealth, both communities of color and rural white communities, the historically uh, isolated and often condemned historical black communities, former freedmen's towns, that our entire system basically profited off of their survival and continued slavery in a system of consumption. Yes. It's interesting that you mentioned the indigenous pushback because it was actually the Standing Rock protest against the Dakota Access Pipeline that triggered these critical infrastructure bills because these petrochemical companies are saying, we don't want to be standing rocked. They know that engaged activism is the single most powerful force to stop the incredible injustice of this build out of fossil fuels and plastics. So these critical infrastructure bills are passing around, uh, going around the country, they outlaw protest, as Yvette said, constitutionally um, protected, First Amendment protected free speech and protest against fossil fuels, against plastics, and the Texas one includes CAFO bills too. I mean, CAFO Farm shows you uh, who's making their corporate lobby donations in that list. Um, but if we lose the right to protest this kind of injustice, this kind of pollution, we are going to lose so much more. So please add this to the list of things that you are tracking. I would add that in the narrative gathering we had not too long ago here or nearby in Occidental, Casey Camp Hornick, who is part of the Ponca Nation and part of the voices that screamed water is life to all of us here, also said that plastic is death in such a very short, succinct, and powerful message. And that's something that we need to resonate with. Plastic is death. That's right. Thank you. Emma, um, it seems like the, you pl dis the discourse around plastic and the willingness to regulate plastic is different in the European Union than it is here. Can you share any reflections about the different approaches and why is it that the European Union has been able to make advances, it's not good enough, but advances that we still have not been able to yet? Absolutely. So actually, it came from the awareness of the impacts of plastic on the ocean. And in Europe in 2012, we had a new directive to protect our, our oceans and waterways because they're incredibly degraded and, and threatened in so many different ways. And one of the elements of uh, a, a protected ocean was protecting it from marine litter. And we all, we all know from this film that the, that is the end point and there is so much more happening with plastic all the way through its life cycle. But activists really took that. That was the area of interest from the policymakers. And at that time, it was pretty much ignored by a lot of the big corporations. We were able to use the evidence of what is turning up on the beaches, like the top 10 items most frequently found, and use that to lobby for specific legislation on those items. And it started off with plastic bags. 
we had a law in uh, 2013, I think, or 2014, that forced uh, every country in the European Union to drastically reduce their plastic bag usage. It's about an 80% reduction that they are legally obliged to do, either by uh, banning them or um, placing a charge on the plastic bags or voluntary measures. This was... This simple law, it was literally like half a page of text inserted into another piece of legislation. It, involved, it, it caused a huge response from the plastic industry, from the supermarkets, because they knew that this piece of legislation that seemed so trivial was opening the door to a lot more. We also knew that, and that's why we fought so hard. The initial law didn't have any targets in, it didn't have any obligations, and through the amazing power of the uh, civil society in Europe and citizens, we were able to really strengthen this piece of legislation. And we have seen huge amounts of reduction in plastic bag use across Europe. And one of the really interesting things from this law was that researchers were able to find that the popularity amongst normal citizens of this idea of being charged for plastic bag use actually increased once the law was uh, implemented. And that wasn't expected. You know, you're taking away people's convenience, you're asking them to change their behavior, to plan ahead. They were expecting it to be really unpopular, but that wasn't the case. And so this really, really paved the way to this legislation, banning straws and plastic cutlery and plastic plates, um, like a whole host of other different things. The things that are most found on our beaches they're now going to be either banned or have specific measures on them. And that's only 10 items. And as you said, it is nowhere near enough. And we do get a lot of criticism from people, like, why only straws? Why only 10 items? But it's, as a person who works on policy, you see it's this tiny incremental steps that have opened the way to actual genuine plastic reduction. And that is why the industry themselves fought it tooth and nail with everything they have. And once we've shown that this is doable, once we force the companies to change their ways when it comes to you know, how they provide beverages to you, the next step is all the rest of the packaging and all the other plastic products that are causing such a huge problem to us. That's the theory anyway, we have to see. <laughs> I think the companies often fight these kind of laws because they think it's a foot in the door, but we love these kind of laws because it's a foot in the door. Yeah. <laughs> this is how we start. But another thing the companies are doing in the U.S. is they're, they're working for something called preemption. They are trying to get laws passed around the U.S. that outlaw laws banning plastic. Um, so it's you know, so much for our democracy. Um, Tisa, I wanted to ask you, um, it's such, you have such an interesting background that you were a lawyer for many years and now you're doing this plastic and very related climate work. And so there's multiple levels at which we can combat plastic. There's raising public awareness, there's doing corporate campaigns to shift corporate practice, and then there's changing laws. Can you share some thoughts about how those three fit together? And really, what's the role of law in advancing solutions? Yeah, when I first started out, I was... Um um, looking for other things to do, basically, and commercial lawyering was just not working for me. And there was some something interesting that I picked up as I was looking at other professions was that um, uh, the lobbying profession is actually quite quite a popular profession, um, and um, they work with a number of different skill sets. Uh, they work with not just lawyers, but they also work with PR. Uh, with uh, marketing skill sets, um, and they work uh, with you know economic analysis skill sets. So all kinds of skill sets combined together, um, hiring the best people on the you know um, on the job market, um, you know the best graduates um, in order to serve uh, the private sector, in order to have them um, you know have legislations that are friendly to the private sector. Um, and I thought, well, that's very convenient, you know, um, that they have this service. Isn't it amazing? But at the same time, uh, legislation is not supposed to only serve the private sector. Legislation is supposed to serve everyone. Um, and who's serving everyone? Who is, the, who is the lobbying firm that's serving the everyone here? Uh, that was my question when I, when I first started out. And I thought, well, let's do that. Let's serve that, you know. Um, and so, you know, the plastic bag diet movement became something that uh, was very fun on the outside. We did campaigns. Um, we do school educations because everybody asks, oh, are you, are you doing school educations? Because everybody asks that. So we did school educations. Um, and that's why <laughs> we have school programs. Um, but behind that, we also 
we did a lot of boring things, you know. We did a lot of drafting. We um, we speak to. We have hundreds of meetings a month, just talking to government people, presenting them slides, explaining how this system is going to work, explaining how okay, the, you know, pie charts, explaining the the latest surveys of of people, how they're supportive of new legislations, you know, all that stuff that doesn't get that doesn't get to the surface and nobody really understands that there's a, a lot of work behind that. Um, and that's where, you know, uh, that's where, that's where legislation comes in because that's what it takes to get to legislation. So we, we work with the national governments, we work with re regional governments, and we finally got to a place where um, we're trusted by governments to help them draft laws. But that's not enough. It's, it's really not enough. So I'll just give you an example. Bali banned plastic bags in December 2018, and we helped uh, the government of Bali to draft that law, um, making sure that it's you know airtight, that it's not subject to lawsuits and things like that. Still, it got sued. So it got sued by the Recyclers Association, and I'll, it's, I'm not going to explain why it was the Recyclers Association, because that's going to be the second day of their eight day um, <laughs> of your eight day <laughs> networking session. Um, but it got sued, and then we were like, oh, "Really?" So we have to get back to the uh, drawing board, and then we think about um, uh, what you know what they're suing based. They're saying that cities in Indonesia are not allowed to ban plastic bags because the country hasn't banned plastic bags. So there's no national law. They're saying there's no national law, and this city law is against national law. So they took it to, you know, a, a constitutional level, um, and so we fought that, and we 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 uh, we assembled the environmental lawyers together, and then we drafted something that we gave to the Supreme Court, and we told them that yes, absolutely, cities are allowed to ban plastic bags because of their autonomy and whatever, and we won, right? <laughs> it was. It was an emotional, but yes, we won. But was that enough? No, because after we won, and then the, the biodegradable um, private sector wanted to start selling plastic bags in Bali. And when I say biodegradable, I mean the bad ones, not the good ones. That they don't actually biodegrade. Biodegradable. They're oxo-degradable. So if, if it's a technical term, but if every, anybody's aware, oxo-degradable means that they're, they're, they're actually just disintegrating into microplastics that you can't see, but they're still there in the environment. And so we have to fight that. We're saying the EU has banned Oxium. So you cannot uh, legalize something that's been banned by the EU. Cool. Yay, EU. <laughs> and they're saying, oh, that the EU, it doesn't biodegrade in the EU because the EU has four seasons and Indonesia has two seasons. We have a longer, hotter oh season. God. So it can biodegrade. So you guys have um, windmills cause cancer. And we have <laughs> we have a different hoax, which is that oxium is biodegradable in, in countries with two seasons. So you know that's what we're. It's a constant. It's a constant battle, and we're still fighting, even though we have legislation. But definitely, legislation is is you know as soon as you have legislation, everything becomes focused. Everybody fights this, and we know where the battle is. Thank you. <laughs> um, Roy, I wanna ask you about the Philippines. The Philippines has gotten a lot of press in recent years by being hit by really extreme weather. And I would say the Philippines is also hit by really extreme waste. And we saw some of the footage in that film, which is so shocking. And there is definitely a narrative here of those dirty Asians. The Asians are, are polluting the oceans. You know, can't they handle their waste? And as you said, so clearly the decisions about the waste that's in Manila Bay were made by corporations that are largely based in the United States. So what is your message to them and how can all of us who live here amplify your message to be heard by those corporations? Uh, I think two things. Uh, number one is to help us cha change the narrative. Um, there's definitely a push for um, false solutions that are happening from, from the industry side, recycling as a solution, or that this is simply just a waste management issue, uh, things like that, and that Asians we have this problem of marine plastic because Asians can't be bothered to uh, put our waste in uh, a trash can. But the reality is that uh, solutions are happening. Communities are working on this. Uh, in some places for the longest time, for the past 20, 30 years already, right? Uh, the problem is that they didn't have enough resources to scale it up. So I think that's uh, 
one, one part of it is to recognize that there are solutions happening already. Second is to build power on this. Um, groups based in the US and Europe have direct access to the same companies that are making these decisions. Um, yes, plastic pollution might be very visible in the Philippines and other Asian countries, but actually the pollution started in the boardrooms where these decisions are made, and this is where you could help us. Thank you. Thank you. Steve, finally, I'm throwing you a, what do you call it, not the curveball, the good one. I'm throwing you a softball. I'm throwing you a softball, which is, I know that making this film was an incredibly um, emotionally and intellectually challenging and rewarding and inspiring experience for you. What did you leave out that was the thing you were most sorry to have to leave out because of time that you want to make sure people know about? I'm not sure that's a softball. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was giving you a free pass to, like, to say anything you version, want. <laughs> but, uh, you know, a lot of the people you saw in this film are, are leaders within their respective uh, regions and, and countries. And they have whole teams of people who implement the work um, and are visionaries in and of themselves. Uh, so, you know, like, and we interviewed a lot of those people too. And because we had to tie an entire global system and supply chain together in 90 minutes or less, um, and I think we ended up with about 439 hours of footage, something close to that. Um, so we, we're going to make Story Plastic 2, 3, 4, 5. Um, I, there were so many more voices uh, that I wish we could have included. Um, there are so many people who are working tirelessly for very low wages, um, uh, whether in, they're in this country or another. Um, you know, this, you don't make money doing this work. And um, even when you become a leader in, in this work. And, you know, I think of a woman named uh, Maricon Mendez in, in the Philippines who, you know, bent over backwards to get us out on boats to get some of the footage we needed while her house was flooding from a typhoon um, and pregnant. Um, uh, I think of uh, Priggy's wife, Daru, who took Megan around to show us this waste import sites um, while she was defending her PhD the next day. Um, you know, I think of like countless characters we came across whose stories are amazing and inspiring, but also they're just, their sense of duty and their expertise. And uh, I wish we could have, I mean, you know, Dea said at the end of the film, this is a small sampling. It is. It's a small sampling um, of a breadth and scope of a movement that inspired me to want to make this movie in the first place. Um, so I could quit talking on microphones um, and hear uh, some other people who really deserve them uh, on those microphones. Thank you. They did just hand me a note saying that we have to wrap up 15 minutes earlier than anticipated, and I do want to leave time for an announcement from Miriam and for questions, so we're going to do a really quick lightning, lightning rod right now for each of you, a lightning round. What do you want people who watch this film, who are in this room or are watching the live stream, what do you want them to do? What can each of us do to address this enormous problem? Should we just go down the row? Okay, so in uh, about a month, Break Free From Plastic movement is holding a global week of action to target those consumer goods companies who are polluting our world. So get involved. You can take action. Write letters to them. Tweet at them. You know, get angry and at them <laughs> because they need to know that it isn't just a bunch of, you know, NGOs. It's everybody who is pissed off with this. And we are pissed off. Freud. Yes, definitely get angry, but also be inspired of the things that are happening right now. There are so many things that are uh, happening in different communities, and I think that's worth celebrating. So let's change the narrative around this. Thank you. Recognize that plastic is shortening the lives of people at the fence line and front line, and find the shadow communities that live, that you live next door, and uplift mm -hmm. those narratives, and finally, buy less, period. Just buy less.
I would repeat by less. By less, um, but do more. Uh, mm -hmm. Do screenings um, wherever you are, whether you have communities, whoever you want to influence, uh, please influence. Um, and also, if you have donors <laughs> that can be influenced, please influence them uh, to support this movement. Thank you. And how do people support this movement? I think the first thing I want people to do is quit asking what I can do and start asking what we can do. Um, because I don't think you can do anything by yourself other than create personal efficiencies in your own home. Um, we need collective action, and it needs to be representational of everybody affected on this. Secondly, I, I want the person who is watching the live stream or, or out here is to realize, like, this is your film. This, this is, this, this, the intention of this film was for everybody who was inspired by it to create an event, to bring it to their organization, to use it to fundraise, to do whatever. It is, it is the intellectual property of anybody who cares about this issue. We want you to take it and run with it. Daya? Um, I would love to encourage people to keep questioning the narrative. As you saw in the film, every time people, a, a community, a society gets a new awareness, the industry pivots their messaging to counter that. And people settle down and don't fight as hard because they hear the message that says, oh, it's okay. We can, we can recycle, we can do this and that. Um, and that's gonna keep happening. So as we rise up, as we get stronger, they're going to keep pivoting their messaging. So if you, if you hear something that sounds too good to be true, look at the bottom of the page. Look who's paying for that site. Look who's funding that work. Look who those people are connected to. There's, it probably is too good to be true. And we need to keep listening to these voices and doing what we know is right and imperative. Thank you. Um, before I open it up, I just want to say that we are really in an incredible moment. Um, Zoe Carpenter in the film said she'd never remembered such a high level of public awareness on plastic, but I do remember it. In the late 80s and early 90s, so Miriam's nodding, the other long timers here remember this, there was a growing concern about plastic. Um, it, it, was, it was like it is now. We didn't have, the internet wasn't so widely available, but it was the same kind of thing. And the plastics industry did exactly what Dea said, is they pivoted. We had a choice to start investing in solutions, which is reductions, as Yvette said, buy less crap. And, and the stuff that we do use, well, they need to make it more responsibly. We didn't choose that as a society because they used three tactics to dissuade us. They said it's recyclable, they export it, and they said we're gonna burn it because it's a clean energy. Those three things are now proven as absolutely bogus. They are not on the table anymore. So we are in a moment again with that same kind of public pressure, even more so because we don't have the export option. Who else gets to, as a society, go back and do over when you made the massively wrong choice? We are in an incredibly important moment. If we make the wrong choice this time, there's not a big runway again. This is it. So please get involved in this movement. Donate your money, donate your time, donate your voice, march in the streets, do what it takes because we have got to get it right this time. I just want Miriam to make a quick announcement about an opportunity here to get involved locally and then we'll open it up to questions. Hi, I'm Miriam Gordon with Upstream. So we work on local solutions and um, many of you are thinking, what can we do about plastic locally? We need to turn off the tap, obviously, on plastic. But one of the problems is that we're always looking for technological fixes, something else to replace the single-use plastics that we have, some other single-use item. And I think really we need to be thinking about not a lot of communities around here um, are trying to be on the cutting edge in the Bay Area in California and moving towards compostable foodware and compostables. But compostables are turning out to be another, another myth, just like recycling has been a myth. So here in Marin County, your compost facilities won't take bioplastics uh, and won't take a lot of compostable foodware. So let's not go down that path. Let's not choose 
another alternative. Let's not treat our communities as disposable. Let's be indisposable. And so we are offering you a new local action to pursue. Uh, Martin Bork, if he's still here, was a leader in Berkeley, uh, creating a new ordinance that says Berkeley is now going to be disposable free. When you walk into a restaurant, you're not going starting in January. You're not going to be served on any kind of disposable foodware, not recyclable plastics, not compostable corn or fiberware. It's all got to be reusable. And addressing that whole, all of the single use in the takeout industry, Berkeley said, we are going to start charging for single use uh, takeout cups, disposable cups, to do what we did with bags, which is to get people to bring reusables, to make reusable the default, not disposable. And what we're doing at Upstream is iterating that kind of policy approach all over the country right now. Here in Marin County, um, your cities, the Mill Valley and other cities are looking to the county to develop a model ordinance. If you live in Marin County, go to your city council and say, we need to do what Berkeley did and we need to do what San Francisco is considering doing. We need uh, to stop having disposable single-use foodware. And San Francisco is uh, considering an ordinance right now that would not only char would make uh, no disposables for on-site dining, charges on food containers and cups, and bring about the economic environment to make reusables win over disposables. So if you live in San Francisco, this is your time to stand up and say no to disposables. Go to indisposablesf.org or hashtag indisposablesf and learn what you can do. Um, we have, uh, the, the hearings are starting tomorrow and uh, moving over the next few months to get a disposable free dining ordinance in San Francisco. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, because no community should be disposable. Yes. Can you stand up so people can hear? Sure. Uh, I just wanted to ask the filmmakers, like the Bully campaign, they had $5 million to bring their film into schools and really make a major campaign. They got PR involved. You know, we have to start lobbying at that level. Are you planning to create a campaign like that with this, your beautiful, powerful, important film? Absolutely. Um, he, he, the question was, uh, he talked about the No Bully campaign, which got $5 million to get their film into schools, and he wanted to know about the follow-up campaign to get this film out there and use it as an organizing tool. Absolutely. I mean, we, we made this film as a tool for exactly that purpose. Um, we're figuring out those details still, but that is absolutely the intent. We definitely want to get it into schools. We want to get it into communities. We want to give people access to it so they can host their own screenings and and watch this um, in a group, in community, and have these discussions. Yeah. Also, if I could just say, Nikki Davies, can you stand up? Nikki um, runs the Plastic Solution Fund, and she is out there every day working her tail off, raising money to support this work. So if anybody has $5 million or any <laughs> sub amount of that and would like to donate to this movement, we really, really need it. Please talk to Nikki Davies afterwards. Uh, yes. So I, I have two mixed messages. Here, maybe we can use this. Try this microphone, see if it helps. Uh, I'm sorry. Here, pull that and see if that helps. Uh, you were saying that um, it's more than I, it's we. And you were talking about, you know, community action. And you just told us what to do in San Francisco, Mill Valley, and copying what went on in Berkeley. So this doesn't feel like something big enough. I, what I took away from this film, the, the hope I have from this film, is that someone will actually come up with a substitute that is biodegradable. And that will make it so that all of these things that are done at corporate headquarters, and you described your travails when you passed the law and it was challenged, and then you passed another law. I mean, this can go on for 30 years. It's not when we have to do something faster than that. And I, I don't know what, I'm not a chemist, I have no, I'm not a scientist of any kind, but where is the, what is the status of the alternatives to this packaging stuff. Does anyone know that? I appreciate your question. 
it's not my job to solve the problem of a polluting industry. It's my job to hold them accountable. That's what collective action does. The effort that Upstream is creating, as well as the Ecology Center, that is going to scale city by city by city by city, like wildfire. It takes someone to start something, and it takes a movement to support her in that. And so that is the kind of change we are going to create. What's big enough is not uh, what you see today. That's absolutely correct. But what we did here is we connected the dots and we showed all the people working along the system and all the places we need to intervene. Industry has wanted this to stay at an ocean plastics issue for a very long time. They have not wanted to hear from a vet's community. They have not wanted to hear from Teza's community because that exposes them. So the first step is that we have changed a narrative and we will inspire a tremendous amount of people to get involved. We are not looking to substitute one thing for another. Fundamentally, we're looking to reduce and change culture on how we have products delivered uh, because this is not possible. There is no alternative that you can create that is entirely benign on a planet of seven and a half billion people. To create the kind of resiliency and the solutions you want, you have to get away from a, a few companies in the world owning the resources and the product delivery systems. And when I say a few, I'm talking about 10 to 12 you know, of, of those. So that is the first step, is we have to change the perception of how we get goods and services delivered to us. And the way we do that are two things. We act locally and we spread the campaign that Miriam and Eva are running across the country. And we also um, push back so hard on these consumer brands that the CEO of this company, that she makes a decision based on fiduciary obligation that says, I have to reduce plastic. I have to change how I do business because uh, it's so bad for our bottom line. And that's our power, and we'll rise that. I want to just chime in one more thing there. There are alternatives to petrochemical plastics right now that exist. I recently had an off-the-record conversation, so I can't tell you who it was with, but somebody at one of the multinational packaging corporations that you saw in that film, and I said, what's the latest technology you guys are coming up with? They've got plastic substitutes made out of mushrooms. They've got plastic substitute that turns into fish food when it gets wet. They totally know how to do it. This is not a technical problem. This is a political and cultural and economic problem. So when they told me about all these alternatives, I said, so great. Could you use them, please? And they said, we will never, ever, ever use them because virgin plastic is so cheap, because the real costs of plastic are subsidized onto communities like where Yvette is from, and because they get so many billions of dollars of subsidies. So I said, okay, for an organization like Greenpeace, what can an organization like Greenpeace do to change the conditions to make the alternatives economically viable? They said, keep it in the ground. They said, fight new fossil fuels. Fight every new pipeline, every new pump, every new permit, every new port expansion. They said, fight fossil fuels. That's how we do it. But don't think that there is some magical technical thing. Even when there are bio-based things, they use chemicals. They use energy. We're running out of arable land because of climate change. Do you want vast swaths of arable land growing some kinds of crops that can be used for a single-use plastic that we use for five minutes and throw away. We need a much more fundamental response and let go of the hope for a magic techno fix. Yes, sir. Right. Um, so from the audit, I think two of the biggest violators were Coke and Pepsi, the obviously single-use beverage, aluminum and PET. What, what are the economics and recyclability of aluminum relative to PET? I think I heard a stat like, 71% of all aluminum ever mined is still being recycled and used. So that would just seem like an easy substitute if it is more environmentally friendly. So it's interesting you bring that up because we're in the UK, maybe here as well, we're seeing a lot of uh, bottled water companies moving to cans of water and positioning this as the environmentally friendly solution to the plastic problem. Aluminium 
production and the recycling of it is an incredibly toxic process. So it can keep going round and round and round and round, but you have you know huge tail pools of toxic waste that has to go somewhere. And again, the same problems, often it is in poorer communities, in, in, in communities that don't have the same level of um, representation and, and voice that we do, and that's people who are having to deal with those toxic um, uh, side effects of aluminium recycling. So I'm not an expert on this, so I can't give you the technical details on this, but what's, I'll just reiterate what uh, everybody else here has said. We need to use less. And, you know, I used to live in, um, in the Philippines for a few years, which was a wonderful country. I absolutely adore it. And there, like, I used to get my Coca-Cola when I needed it in a glass bottle that was all, like, super scratched up and really scruffy because it was being refilled. Everybody in the community would pay a deposit, they'd return it. And this was on a tiny island and it was working perfectly. Coca-Cola is going in there and trying to dismantle those systems. They want us to be using single use because they no longer have to deal with it. So, you know, we have the solutions. If you really want to drink your delicious fizzy sugar, sugar water, you know, it should be in a reusable glass bottle that is reused repeatedly and it's refilled in a local area. So it isn't being shipped, you know, hundreds of miles to uh, plants that's on the other side of the country. So like a big part of their business model is single use or recycling, because they're not paying for the recycling, that's somebody else who's doing that. So, you know, they just want to push out their products and get it done out the way. So that's what we're trying to fight, is make them take responsibility for the things that they're producing. They said we have to stop at 2.45. Yes, we have to stop. I'm so sorry, because we have, it's so amazing to have these people here. Please go to storyofstuff.org, go to storyofplastics.org, go to Break Free From Plastic, join the movement, add your dollars, your voice, your feet. We need you, and we actually can win this time and turn this around. Thank you so very much. Yeah.